Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Building a Bridge. This is, I think, week three now. My name is Jesse Brizendine. My name is Jared Countess, and our mission is to empower people to use their voice to build a bridge beyond race relations, creating unity and understanding, and effectively raising the collective consciousness of humanity. And I have to give a huge shout out to the group. Um, I am engaging with you guys in these conversations and I really I feel like the collective consciousness of this group is raising everyone is is, is building each other we're we're adding our own perspectives um we're, we're it's a beautiful mix of 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 education and experiences and life and trials and tribulations and we're and we're able to communicate those things to each other and and find that compassion and that empathy and that understanding that is so hard to find elsewhere in the world today. It's um, especially with people with different viewing points. It's 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 uh, you see how we we're connected, right? Wow. You see how connected we are. It's amazing. Yeah, it really has been incredible to see. And for those of you who might be, this is, might be your first time watching this series, we encourage you to join our Facebook community, which is just facebook.com building a bridge 2020, or I'll put a link in here somewhere, or you can just message Jerry or I, we'll get you added in. But we really are having some incredible discussions that are evolving in the group. And what's amazing about it is, is it's not the typical discussions you see in the world where it's a right versus wrong, or you're wrong and name calling or anything like that. It's people asking tough questions, presenting uncomfortable points of view, and really being able to have meaningful, meaningful under discussions and being able to go deep in a safe and loving environment where people are able to be seen, heard, and understood. And we had a really incredible discussion starting to evolve off our last video, which is where we started to talk about systemic racism. Jared really did one of the most amazing, I think, explanations of systems in action. And we got down to the difference between growing up black versus growing up white. And when Jared talked about the black kids growing up in more urbanized environments, whereas white kids probably grew, to, grew up in more rural environments, we talked about the differences of growing up poor black and poor white. I shared some of my experiences growing up as a poor white kid. And one of the things that we really came to at the end was why is it that crime may escalate in the black community over the white community? And we were talking about the origins of crime. So when little kids go out and they're doing things and they're you know, stealing stuff. And whereas a white community, I might be stealing something to try to get a movie ticket or something like that. Whereas in a black community, and we, we brought in Uncle Jimmy or Cousin Jimmy from the first video, they're doing it to put food on the table. And you start to see that some of these criminal actions might be an origin of love, fun. You know, it's, it's innocent enough. But when you're young like that and you don't know any better, it, it escalates very quickly and then we go from that. And so we wanted to pick up on part two today and talk a little further about systemic racism and just discuss it from our own perspectives. We have, a, we have an article we're gonna share that I think really speaks powerfully to this and then hopefully get into discussion about what some possible solutions are and the psychology around it. You're gonna show the picture, bad, right? <laughs> are you gonna show the picture, or are we go? Yeah. Uh, so um, we'll we'll start with that. So right before we met today, Jared sent me this newspaper headline, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen here. What we want to do first is we are going to give a just our knee jerk responses to this. And full disclosure, we've we've looked at it already. We've talked about it. We've kind of gone through some talking points we want to make sure we cover with this because we think it's a really great illustration of, of some of the, the things that collectively this group is trying to tackle. And we also want to do a fair lip service to our knee jerk responses. Me as a white guy, Jared as a black guy, and just tell you what we saw initially when we looked at it. So let me pull this up. All right. Jared, do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Um, <laughs> as as long as it doesn't interrupt, I'll I'll go I'll go first. Cool. Um, okay. So when I first saw this, I was like, "Oh fuck, not again!" Right. So I'm like, you know, 
Um, as a black man, you see, you know, crime and a picture of a guy and a black guy committing a crime. And, you know, I, I get upset, I get upset at my people and my community, everything else. And usually I just fucking pass it through. Right. And then I look at the other headlines, uh, 19 year old arrested, uh, for Tuesday homicide. Right. And I look and I see that the picture of the guy who, who killed somebody, right. That said, he's a white guy. And I'm like, well, murder isn't the main, isn't the main story. The main story is the burglary suspect, the, the black guy. Right. And I'm like, well, why is, why is that? Like, why is that picture bigger than that picture? Right. And then I look down and I see deputy ex constable killed in line of duty. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Like, why is the biggest picture on here? The, the black burglary suspect and you have two murders, right? Two murders on the same paper, but this, you know, and, and so, and this is, June 17th, 2020, right? This is like right now. And so as a black man, my initial knee jerk reaction actually is, is one of disgust, to be honest with you, my own community and my mm-hmm. own community. And then I, I, if, I'm, if I'm cognizant, if I don't just pass it by and I look at the other stories, I'm like, well, what the fuck? Like, why would they do that? Like, why would, why would that be the main story? And then I'm upset um, at the newspaper, at the editors, at the, at the system, right? Because that's not fair, you know? And so that's, and that's my, uh, that's my knee jerk reaction. And then everything else is like, so go ahead. So I, I, I you know. <laughs> so, Jared, thanks for sharing. And so for me, you know, when I see that, I, I, I plead guilty right off the bat to being someone who, you know, we, what do we have? We have ambulance chasers in the physical reality and, and sometimes being the headline chaser, or headline reactor. And when I see that, the first thing I see is this picture of a car that's messed up. And I see this pic- picture that's bigger than most of the paper of a black guy. And I think, why the fuck does this person have to go and ruin somebody else's life? You know, and it's just like, and then where it goes after that, I don't even look further. But I see, I see a picture of a guy, and I see that he's black, and I see that the picture makes him look, he looks scary. He has that picture of like where I would stereotype a mugshot of a black guy. And then I think that, you know, there's almost like this, God, I hate even saying this, but there's almost like this, well, that's typical type thing or something like that. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and that just, it makes me sick to even say that. But when I'm looking at headlines like that, as I'm talking about it, I'm thinking of all the other headlines I've probably seen of something similar like that. And then quite frankly, I don't even see the rest of the paper. I don't even <laughs> see the, the rest of it. I just see this picture and I know, and here, here's the thing that I'm so grateful Jared brought this up today because I teach this stuff. Okay, I teach this stuff. I talk about this stuff professionally every day. And I am conditioned to respond in such a way with it where I see that and I just go through that. And so it goes into the files into my data bank inside of my mind of which is what are criminals supposed to look like? What is criminal behavior supposed to be like? What are stereotypes supposed to be? How is it fulfilling out? And all those types of things. And so and it's literally just that word, yeah, that's typical, comes out. And it's disgusting. So then when I actually look closer with it and see that there's a 19-year-old re- arrested, again, I don't even see the homicide piece because I'm just seeing this picture of a black guy, this picture of a, a car, and thinking, well, that's obviously the most important thing, right? We're taught that the bigger it is, you know, you always want to make the most important thing, usually displayable, everything else like that. I look closer and I see this little tiny picture of this white guy that I had to really lean in and squint to even see it was a white guy. And then I really think like, wait, well, what the fuck is going on here? What the fuck is going on here? Like, how is it that 
in this piece of paper, three quarters, 75 plus percent of it is going to a guy who stole a car, who broke into a car, I'm guessing burglary. So it's breaking into it, not even necessarily stealing, just breaking into it. His picture is bigger than the entire article on the 19 year old respect, suspected for arrested for homicide. And then it goes into this whole other piece of when I actually look closer and see that, I get pissed. I get pissed because of, I realize, you know, somebody was it, it was a John Maxwell or Brian Tracy, one of those two who, who are really prominent in the leadership space and written more books on leadership than anyone else. Somebody once asked them, they said, what is essentially, what is leadership? And they said, influence. They said, influence. Because when you're able to influence people, you're able to essentially lead them. And I mean, this like is John me, Maxwell. you know, this is me like saying not what they're saying, but when you're able to influence somebody, you're essentially able to lead someone down to follow beliefs that you have. I am, I feel like fairly intelligent, fairly self aware. And when I see this, because I've been so conditioned, like many of us to scroll through, not really past looking at the ticker on whatever's on the gym ticker at that time or not look deeper. I take this one picture and allow it to dictate my reality. And then what happens too? So now if I really start to dig deeper into my own psychology, I have this profile etched into my mind. It's attached to this suspect, this, this big piece of text that is associating that with criminality. Mm -hmm. And now what do I do? When I go out on the street and walk around, I see someone who has similar features, similar skin tone. Do I look differently? Do I feel differently? Do I react differently? And they couldn't be sitting there buying ice cream with their kids. But because in my unconscious mind, I've already made the decision and this has been so prominent. And because I had that knee jerk emotional reaction to it, typical, whatever that is, I am now going out and, and allowing that, that judgment, that bias to dictate my experience throughout life. And I'm certainly not doing the same thing with the white guy where I'm going out and thinking when I see the white guy out there and saying, oh, that, that's probably another murder suspect, <laughs> another homicide suspect. So I think this really leads into the question, Jared, what can we do to change this? How do we start to, how do we start to, where, you know, where's the solution? How do we begin? And I imagine too, like, <clears throat> here, here's just one other piece of it. I struggle with, I struggle with the notion and I understand that media is a business in a sense. Because then what I also would look like in digging deeper with that too, in the digital world, if you, you run an ad on Facebook, you do what's called a split test. And a split test is, is you'll take the same headline. Oh, now you're digging deep. Okay. Yeah, dude. <laughs> you know where I'm going with this now too. Mm -hmm. So you have a split test, which is where you take the same, you take a same similar headline and you'll just switch small little variables, a, a, a piece of text or a picture. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to see and figure out what gets the most clicks, what gets the most reactions. And then what happens is, is you put your ad budget behind it. Now, advertisers have been doing this for a long time. The Super Bowl commercials that companies spend millions and millions of dollars on to run, they're not just putting it together. One person has this idea and they say, okay, they're going and they're testing it to audiences. Movies will do this where they'll, they'll put the movie together and then they'll go start doing what they call screenings to audiences to see where the audience reacts. And if they don't react the way they want, they'll reshoot and do reshoots. So where that comes to this is where my real concern about this is is I'm imagining that people are paying a subscription, paying money to get this paper or other media similar to it. And this could be the CNN we watch, this could be the Fox News, whatever it is. And the reason that this comes up is not necessarily even because, I'm just gonna play in this space. Let's say this comes up not necessarily because it's they're racist or biased or prejudicial. 
But the reason this comes up is because they have split tested so many different images and they have found that this combination of displaying the black man in a prominent place looking scary and menacing over the other ones sells more newspapers. Yes. 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 And, but it, 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 it's because here's the deal. It, it compounds and it plays on what would already be established norms, right? And those norms, and that's where we can get into the systemic race because those norms were established when racist, racist practices were around, right? And, and the way that we can get past it is, is just to stand up against it and fight it, right? Um, and this is, the, this is the argument for getting, you know, for Aunt Jemima changing, changing its name, right? Or um, things like that. This, that's the argument for that, right? Is, is that, um, not that I necessarily agree with it, but that's the argument for it um, is, but stuff like this, right? It's because of stuff like this that they're talking about that. That is relatively innocent, but this right here is not, right? This right here is, is the reason that this sells better, right? Is because it's, it's based upon stereotypes that people already believe. It's based upon stereotypes that our people already believe. So you're willing to accept that paradigm so much faster than if you were to put the white guy murder up front, right? I mean, just, you know, this is, people talk about it, but like, I'll see a picture of Dylan Roof. Have you ever heard of Dylan Roof? Yeah, wasn't he the, he was the, the anti-Semitic shooter, right? Or something, was he, he was one of the shooters, right? He, he walked into the black church and yeah. killed, killed uh, it was like seven or nine people, right? Yeah. And, and, um, and they prayed with him before he killed them. You know, they prayed, you know, and I remember like I saw a picture of him, people were putting up the Black Lives Matter stuff. And like you give this guy water and whatever, but you know, and he just killed seven people or nine people, right? Sitting him on there, sitting him on the side, right? And you strangle this guy or whatever. When I first saw that picture, I didn't even fucking know who that was. Like, like that's not, I am, that's not mentally locked into my brain, right? Think about, do you remember the name of the guy who shot up the people in Vegas? Um, I remember his face, I don't remember his name, and that's only just because I just read about him the other day. <laughs> exactly like you know like that's those those things are not even though those things have happened it's and and maybe like when we hear mass shooter we do maybe picture a white guy but like it's not necessarily built into your paradigm right yeah but when you picture like i'm a black person and when i think this i picture criminal yeah, right. it's like it's, crime it, and black person have become almost, almost inner, inner, what's the word I'm trying to say, synonymous with one another in the sense of how it's imprinted on our psyche. It is. It is. We, and, 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 and that is a, a systemic, and that's why I was like, at the end of our talk yes, yesterday, I was like, the majority of black people are the, are the Cosby's. The majority of black people are the Cosby's, right? And... Uh, and it's and it's like I I feel the need to continue saying that because you see this even looking at this now right knowing that we just broke it down it's still it's still programming me yeah it's still programming me and and it's and I, I remember when I first realized how strong visual imagery and that kind of programming was I was watching a Red Lobster commercial. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, because I need a fitness thing and all that stuff. And I had no want of Red Lobster before this damn commercial. And they dripped the butter over top of the, over top of the lobster. <laughs> and I was like, oh, so I was like, I want Red Lobster so bad right now. Like, I just like immediately wanted it, right? Immediately. Uh -huh. And I was like, and my mouth was watering and salivating. And I was like, and at that point, I really, like, I understood how strong imagery 
and, and programming like can be. Um, and, and, and again, it's, it's this, that these are those echoes that were built in. And, and, and when we talk about violence in the black community, um, or, or how the black community is, is, is viewed in general, um, in general, right. Not in individual, right. (laughs) Right. You know, but in general, in totality, right. It is a lot of that has been subconsciously programmed into us. Right. Um, and, 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 and pointed out, you know, evils just fucking, when you think redneck, you think stupid. Yeah, yeah. No I think, offense, I think right? bullet, <laughs> plaid shirt, sleeves cut off. Yeah. You know, beer, Miller Lite. Yes. Yes. Beer done. Those, all those be, things. You know, grease if, on the shirt. He, I, can't, I can't do the southern accent, but if he, if he talk like that, you know, yeah. <laughs> you won't think he can have a degree from Harvard. Yeah. yeah <laughs> but yeah. you can think he's <laughs> <laughs> you just are right yeah. and it's and that's programming it's been programmed right um just which is why brokeback mountain was such a big thing because you had gay cowboys yeah what the fuck was that like <laughs> gay cowboys you can't be gay in a cowboy a subconscious programming yeah. right cowboys are tough guys man's man right and so it's it's you know we've been we have all of these different things playing in our, in our mind that, 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 um, that compound on the system that we talked about. Right. Um, and, and they, and they become cyclical. Right. And, and right now, a lot of the arguments are we're trying to break that cycle. Right. And it's not just, it's, it's not just like, Oh, family hooked on welfare, right? Which is some of the com- comments that, you know, or yeah. poor poverty, right? But all of the, all of the thoughts that are associated with it and break that cycle so that we can move forward. And it's really, it's really, really difficult um, <laughs> because it's, it's, it's a lot of subconscious programming and you have to like work really hard to delete it. And, and the truth of the matter is, like I said, I think for the most part, as Americans, we see each other as individuals, Yeah. right? So when I meet you and I speak to you, I'm taking you as you, right? But if I see someone who looks like you on television, I'm taking them as a generalization. Yep. There's a, <clears throat> just, you know, different fields of psychology will evolve this a little bit differently, but as a as a hypothetical, just to give context to kind of some of what we're talking about and the mechanisms of it. So the average human being thinks anywhere from 40 to 80,000 thoughts a day, right? Average human, 40 to 80,000 thoughts. Now you think about how many of your thoughts you remember that you've thought so far today. That's because the majority of those are unconscious. Now what more science is coming out to say is of those the average human being, 40 to 80,000 thoughts, that 75 to 80% are what we might call negative. Most of those negative thoughts are hypercritical of self. It's what we're saying to ourselves about ourselves. You know, I'm stupid. I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? Gosh, I screwed up. Nobody's going to love me. Everybody's thinking about me. Everybody's judging me. Those kinds of things. So that's, that's the dialogue most of us have going through our head. Now let's break this down even more because this is where programming becomes relevant. The average human being at any given moment, and, and I want you all to just do this so you can have an experience with it, just so you can play in this space, please. The average human being has anywhere from 2 million bits of information entering into what we call our unconscious or subconscious field. So that's coming in through sensory input, sight, taste, touch, sound, smell, right? Our conscious mind is able to process a little fraction, of, literally a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of it. Our unconscious mind is able to in- take in all of it. This is why uh, we can do hypnosis and be able to recall some really cool things that we never thought of before because it's stored your unconscious mind is kind of like a hard drive that has all the data in there even though you may not be using all the time it's there whereas your conscious mind is literally the the icon you're clicking on right now now what happens is because we can't make we can't use all that information at once 
we will break it down, we filter it, we distort it, we delete stuff that we don't feel is relevant, and then we generalize things to make it seem the most normal to us, to help us fit into what we call our version of reality. So, which is why the knee-jerk reactions for both Jared and I were important because you could see, like, we just went through our own filter systems and created what we called reality. And then we had a narrative that came out of us that fit the version of reality that we were conditioned to do based off of all that program before. So I just want you to see how this plays out in action. If you, whether you're listening to me right now or you're watching us, what you'll notice is that you haven't paid attention to your feet or if you're standing or your butt if you're sitting. But now all of a sudden that I've called attention to it, you'll notice that you're really acutely aware of how your hips feel, how your lower back feels right now. If you're sitting, because I'm focusing your attention on your lower back, you might feel that you have a little bit of tightness in there. You might feel that you need to shift your weight around or something like that. If you're standing, you might feel your weight starting to rock side to side. Why is this? It's because now what I'm doing is I'm calling your attention to these parts of you that before, because of what you were engaged in this discussion, your unconscious mind had deemed it wasn't necessarily or it wasn't, it wasn't needed to be engaged in this conversation. Now, because I stopped talking about it, you'll notice how quickly you forgot about it. But now we're back to talking about your hips or your feet. You'll notice that you feel more attention there. We have such this small window of attention. And it is, we have information coming at us in so many different ways that we never have before with digital world. So what this is to say is all those things, your hips, your feet, everything else is still there, but it's not part of the conscious reality that you're creating inside of your mind all the time. That's really important because again, when we have massive amounts of information competing for that precious little bit of space in our mind, we have to really consider where it's coming from and what we're doing. I do a massive disservice to myself when all I'm doing is looking at a picture and then forming reality. Now I understand my programming with it. I understand why I'm doing it, but it's when we start to dig deeper and remember that any given time, you always have the ability to ask yourself, what does this mean? What does this really mean? Is there something I'm not seeing? What might be missing? What do I want to learn from this? And invite the possibility to deepen your understanding because most of us get stuck because we go through that initial programming bout and we form a conclusive generalization to it that represents the entire whole. Typical. Fucked up, you know, for both of us, right? Something like that. <laughs> Versus, and I think what Jared just said, that is the truth in the generalization is that majority of us will take a human being at, a, at face value, at another human being. But the problem is, is when we see these types of things in our media, wherever that is, we are unbeknownst to us in our own conditioning, our own programming. We're not seeing the Cosby's, and this was before Bill Cosby had some of his dirty laundry here. <laughs> it's such a bad you know, Yeah. <laughs> We're seeing, what everybody knows, though. Yeah, yeah. We're seeing the Cosby's that we all grew up with and we loved. You know, we all watched as, as kids, as teenagers, as adults. And we, we, we fell in love with. That was the most popular show for a number of years with reason why, because they represented something that we all saw inside of ourselves. We see something different. And so this isn't to say anybody in here is bad, good, right, or wrong. What this is to do is it's to draw attention to how we are conditioned to think, yes. the programming that we have inside of us. And that by having, I, I always say to people, awareness precedes transformation. So now that we can start to recognize an awareness, it gives us a space to start to create transformation. Jesse, that was good, man. <laughs> that was good. You just, you talked about a solution that I could, I could not, I could not find. And that is to, to dig deeper, to break your own paradigms, right? Yeah. To, 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 to be able to, to see beyond to as uh, a guy I likes I like to watch this guy named Tom Billu to get out of the matrix, yeah, right to see beyond the filter, um, and to really ask ask questions about what you're really looking at. That's that was uh that was good, like like I'm I'm very aware when I see a commercial now, what they're trying to do. 
right? I'm very aware. And so I always watch it with that eye. Sometimes it still gets me, but I watch it with that eye. And, and, and if we can be aware of what imagery, and a lot of times the media tries to, to generally portray black males, especially in terms of any kind of altercation with the cops or any kind of thing like that. And, and, um, and we can be more aware of that as a, as a country, right? You know, that would help. That would, that would absolutely positively help. And you know what's funny? So I'll give a, I'll give a shot. I always like to give a concession, right? So right wing Republicans and stuff like one of the conversations that's going on now is, well, we only saw a small piece of the tape. We only saw, we don't know everything that happened there. You know, we gotta, we gotta look deeper. And it's, and it's, and part of the reason why they're doing that is because it goes against their current paradigm, right? (laughs) Right. And so they're like, well, let's dig deeper here and see what, what the real truth is. Right. Because I really want to hold on to this, my belief that the cop was right in the situation and that this guy was wrong in the situation. Right. But the thought process or the, the, the actual going beneath and not just taking something at face value, right, should be done. We should make that universal, yeah. right? It's, we should probably make it more universal when it aligns with our paradigms, right? It should, it, we, should, we should have more alarm bells go off when we see something that um, is, is confirming of our subconscious biases, especially when it's produced by the media. Yeah. as opposed to something that goes against our our subconscious biases because <laughs> because typically yeah. typically they're going to feed us what we what we want to see right typically they're going to feed us what what they feel we align with and so when they feed us something different we should probably like you know like really like question right um and and look and look deeper we should question both but um but when but you know, when it, when it, when it aligns with what we're thinking, like, oh yeah, that black, guy, the big picture, right? Black guy, crime, whatever. And I told you in my own mind, I think, fuck, you yeah. know, of course. Right. In my own mind, I think that. Yeah. And then I go and I look at the rest of the pictures and I go, and I go, of course, again, I go up, oh, there it is. The system is, is, is set up for us to look bad and everything else like that. And, um, so I'm confirming, and and truth of the matter is, it's hard for me still, even looking at that, to delete that subconscious belief, right? So like, I'm not going to dig onto that, but the subconscious, the associated associating crime with my own community, right? As a black man, right? Even though I say the Cosby thing, right? I still that thing is still buried. Mm. if that makes any kind of sense it's still it's still buried back there and it's very hard for me to remove it my whole when i'm home if i'm in baltimore my wife would tell you my whole persona my everything my mannerisms the way i walk the way i speak right the way that i make sure that i'm perceived is different Mm is different. How I look, how I'm, I am in my surroundings is different. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a way I like to behave, but I just feel like I have to level myself up. If that makes any kind of sense. Ah. And, and that's probably, it's probably a reality, but it's probably, you know, even still, it's probably not good. I'm subconsciously programmed to be more alert and more aware of my <laughs> surroundings in my appearance i smile less i fucking you know i i you know i treat everybody as a, it, it's, it's fucking bad man it's bad so i don't live there <laughs> you know it's fascinating too jared like i remember talking to someone in the media one time and asked them why do you guys run the stories that you do why do you run the stories you do because you'll highlight the three bad things that happen, but not the 3,000 good things that happen. 
why do you run the stories? Why do you show the, the one person who broke into a, a house versus highlighting the 9,000 other homes that didn't have anything bad happen to them? And I really appreciated their honesty with me. They took a, a deep breath and they looked at me and they said, there's, a, there's an unspoken saying essentially that goes something like this, that when it bleeds, it leads. Now, I don't want to make a broad sweeping generalization of the media right now because I recognize there's a lot of really incredible people out there who are doing a really incredible job at their, what they do. I, I, I've developed a small affinity for our local news. They, they've done some really incredible things the last several years through the midst of some of the tragedies the community is going through, or even just right now with, with COVID, uh, one of the reporters who works in the local news, she has this ongoing series of looking for the helpers, highlighting people in the community that are going out and trying to do things to help others. And I think that's a really incredible thing and an incredible platform to use media for. Where the speaking to the, where it bleeds its leads, I don't think that's as much of a media problem as that I think it's a people us problem. That, they know that from split testing and seeing what's going to get us the emotional reaction, what's going to get us to buy the paper, turn into the news. And it makes me wonder sometimes too, that, you know, I'm always one that likes to look for actionables, actions we can take, whether it's as individuals or as communities or whatnot. And I wonder what would it be like if we, if we reached out to our local news stations or local papers and we didn't tell them what to report or what not to report, but just saying like in that, in that newspaper article that we just shared, what if it was in three equal columns? You know, what if it was in, if, if we're really going to have, you know, I think that, what, what would that be like? Would it change our emotional experience of it? Because I think we can talk policy all we want, right? And we're going to get into this more as we go down, but we have to get into programming psychology if we want to really make a big, change and elevate yes. consciousness in my opinion mm. and how that's going to be is it's going to really respond there's going to be a large responsibility falling to each of us about how we consume content how we consume media if you if we catch ourselves doing exactly what jared and i did and that's why we want to walk through and be vulnerable with you what our own initial responses were neither of us liked it too we talked about beforehand you know f to say as a black man fuck to say as a white man, oh, it's typical. <laughs> you know, that makes us not sound like the best people at all. <laughs> like I felt, I felt really disgusted by it. But that's also acknowledging programming. It's also acknowledging where, for me at least, it's acknowledging where I can see growth for myself. That a big lesson that came for me today is that when I hear that voice in my head say typical, it's, it's teaching myself that there's an opportunity to ask a question. It's conditioning, it's working on reconditioning myself, just the same as if we're, if we want to lose weight or build muscle, we have to put in the reps, we have to put in the exercise. When we're talking about programming and it's our own, we have to be willing to put in the reps and put in the program, put in the, put in the exercise and put in the time. I think it's very easy to advocate. It's not very easy. I shouldn't say that. I think that it might be more convenient to advocate policy change, but the real work I think is advocating for the own change, our own psychology. Yes. And yes. that is a hard fucking thing to do. And that's why, you know, we, we, I, in my opinion too, we've, we've gotten so great as a culture of weaponizing words, right? Because then if as long as I weaponize a word and I can call you whatever, you can call me whatever, bro, what it does is it puts us in that right or wrong paradigm and it pushes, it, you know, we think that people get defensive because they're trying to defend ourselves. I think it's quite the opposite. And we get defensive because we're trying to push ourselves away from the other person. So we don't have to see the parts in ourselves and them that we may not like about ourselves. Yes. Or, or the parts, or so we don't see the parts of ourselves in them so that we like them yeah exactly so, right because because if we fucking like that we're disagreeing with them and we like them and we can admit that we like them or we yeah. are like them in the midst of that disagreement yeah if we so see that fucking humanity, ruins my whole my whole argument yeah so let me create distance yeah right let me, let me create as much distance as i can yeah <laughs> I take i'm not like you at all 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is, but if it's like if I can take the humanity away from them, yes, then I can keep them in this nice little box that I've created for them called these are the reasons why this person is not like me. Yes. Right? These are the reasons why that I'm so different from them or they're bad or I'm right and they're wrong. Yes. Right? It is because I've made this nice little box called criminal or called, you know, if we go into political terms, liberal, Republican, Democrat, conservative. Whatever it is, we use these labels and then we weaponize the words around them to support them. You and I were talking about this for, for, uh, before we started this series, how scary it was to even consider this because of the fears, the mutual fears that we share of the what we say being taken out of context and then somebody using that to just vilify us because right. we live in a world where that does happen. And it is impossible to have meaningful conversations that can create meaningful change. It is impossible for us to be able to look not only on the things that need to change externally, but the things that we, the internal work that we need to do. If we're allowing ourselves the convenience of weaponized words, because what ends up happening is, is then it excuses us from our own work. Yes. It excuses us from looking deep. When I say typical, and I look at that, dude, just lets me off the hook from even having to see the human being there and about why they may have done that in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you say, fuck, same thing, lets you off the hook. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And boy, is it nice to be able to go on my merry way afterwards and eat a piece of pizza and just enjoy life. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have I have drawn a line between me and that person and their acts. And, you know, they're fucking, their world is so different from my world. They are, they are, what's the word I'm looking for? I, it, it's, you put them in a place, like you said, that dehumanizes them, right? And, it, and, or makes them a different type of human from who you are, right? And you don't associate with humans like that. Yeah. And that, and the, and the, and the, and that and that last part is is really where we can start to dig on some serious cognitive dissonance because most of us do have a, a human that we look at that's a human like that that may have behaved that way at some point in their life, right? And we can understand them, but we can't understand that person. Yeah. Because right? they, they fit this general, they fit this thing. And it's like, whatever. Um, so it, it's the internal, duh, I, I could dig on that all day. I want to, I, I probably, I want to end it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but um, that is that is where we need to go, and your awareness is the first step. I yeah. loved everything you said today, man. Um, you were on a freaking roll, and I had so many like I wanted to like tie in some stuff, and but I was like, no, he's crushing it. Um, and 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 we do. It's I think the most dangerous thing that human beings do is is and this is that reptilian brain that monkey brain is we we've evolved to the point where we're not fighting to survive constantly but because survival is built upon staying away from the negative we still negative 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 and we don't need that anymore now we're at a level where we should be mapping on positivity because a lot of the a lot of those we've minimized essentially, especially here in the United States, the 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 negative threats on life. Right? But we get in arguments over things that are an inconsequential to the overall well being of humanity. Because we're still mapping onto negativity. 
So we pick this small negative thing, the small thing that I disagree with, like we talked about in the beginning with somebody else. And we, and we put as much emotion onto that as possible. Even though it's here and all of these positive things, we have all of these agreements. So we should be mapping here and moving beyond, right? But we're still stuck and we're, we're mapping onto the one even though it's not life-threatening anymore. It's no yeah. longer, it's no longer a life-threatening thing. It's not, it's not the, uh, it's not the thing that's going to get you eaten in the middle of the night. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not the thing that's going to have this person ingesting poison. Right. Um, that's going to kill them. It's, it's just, it's this small different of agreement where if we were back in tribes, you know, living off of the land, no one would give a fuck. Excuse my language. No one, no one would care. Yep. Um, and, and, and so, but we, 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 we map on, we map on to that and we're arguing about it um, to the point of violence even, right? And it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's off-putting and upsetting, right? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, no, I liked it. I liked, I liked everything you had to say today. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting. Because I'm excited for you to give me some solutions um, for the for the psychology piece. Um, I work a lot with my clients with their psychology, and I, shit, I'm still going. Work a lot with my clients with their psychology, um, and how negative thoughts lead to negative behavior. And I just I just had a conversation with a client yesterday. She did a hundred things right for the day, right? She had one thing that she couldn't get done and her whole conversation at the end of the day with me was about the one thing she couldn't get done. Yeah. And I'm like, when you talk about that and you look at me and you talk to me and you sound so down and depressed and everything else, you're, you're negating everything that you achieved, everything that you achieved. And you're a hard worker and you're diligent and you get shit done. Right. And, and you and you in the back of your mind, you know, you did a lot of work. Right. Yeah. But you still feel bad because you didn't accomplish that one thing. And because you feel bad because you didn't accomplish that one thing, you beat yourself up. And then subsequently, you kind of like sabotage some of your other goals. You sabotage that. Over, and you and you say that you'll never get that one thing right. You know, yeah. and, and that's and that is and, and that is we, we do that in 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 so many areas and 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 it's uh it's super dangerous and we'll let's we'll get back on it i think i think i'm i think i'm getting off of off of yeah we'll we'll wrap it up there and and just so we can say on time with everybody we did a pretty good job and i just jared i want to acknowledge you really quick too man i appreciate you holding the space to have this conversation Uh, in full disclosure like one of my fears and even having especially going in this discussion today is that not only how is it going to sound me giving a knee jerk response, but also does it devalue what I do professionally? Because here I'm teaching this stuff and I still struggle with it myself. And I appreciate you letting holding space and just allowing me to be human with that and not judging, not anything, but just listening and hearing and, and having the conversation with me about it. And I appreciate all of you who have been watching along so far and the incredible contributions you've been making to the growing Building a Bridge community, again, we would love for you to be a part of it. If you're wanting to really dive in deep and, and follow along with having these meaningful conversations, being able to have them comfortable, sit with the discomfort. I, I think you probably saw both of us were a little uncomfortable at times today. But to see that by working through that together as opposed to against one another, you can arrive at some ahas and insights. And I think, gosh, what Jared just said at the end was so important, and I hope you all heard it. We can do 99 things right, and we do one thing wrong. We so often get so fixated on this obsession of the differences, the thing that we did wrong, that we're not looking at the higher stuff and attaching emotion to that of all the other things that we are doing right. So there's a lot to digest. There's a lot to unpack here. We, We welcome your comments. We welcome your feedback. Please share your ahas, insights. You know, we 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 want to support you on your journeys, and you know, con- together we'll all continue to build a bridge. 
Yes. Jared, I appreciate you, man. This has been great. Yeah, me too, man. I'm excited for next week's. <laughs> we'll see you, everybody. Bye-bye.